For this chapter, you're going to do an exercise where you look at the licensing properties of verbs, specifically in relation to which of the five canonical clause structures that we're going to talk about the verbs can allow. So this presentation is going to explain those five canonical clause structures. And then when you do the exercise, you are going to see which of them certain verbs can allow. Within a clause, this should be familiar to you, there's always a subject and there's always a verb. Okay, within a canonical clause, there's always a subject in English. We did look at clauses without subjects, but we're restricting this discussion to canonical clauses. The default kind, right? The very basic kind. Okay, so all clauses have verbs and all the canonical ones have subjects. The other two things that can appear are complements and adjuncts. A clause can have one or more of those. Now, we can identify the subject pretty easily in English. It agrees with the verb. So if the verb is third person singular, the subject needs to be two. Its default position is before the verb. So if you're just going to make a canonical clause, you'll get subject verb. However, if you turn that canonical clause into an interrogative clause, you'll get verb subject. So you can see the subject because it's the thing that will appear after the verb in the question, where it appeared before the verb in the, in the, after the verb in the interrogative clause, before the verb in the canonical clause. Now the subject's an external complement of the verb. So technically it's a complement, but it's outside the verb phrase. So normally we'll talk about the internal complements of the verb. Those are going to get a lot more fun. All right. Now the main verb of the sentence, the main verb of the clause, remember, is in a canonical clause, the one that shows tense. It's either present or past. It's true that a clause can have two verbs because one verb can be a complement of another verb. But when you look for the head verb of the clause, look for the main verb, not necessarily the lexical verb. So take the sentence, they are reading, you see two verbs, right? Reading is, of course, a verb. Read is a verb, and reading is a gerund participle form. And it's a lexical verb of this clause, but it's not the main verb. The one that's showing present tense is are, right? The one that's agreeing with the subject is are. Because if it said she, it would have to be she is reading. Reading doesn't change, but the be verb is agreeing with the subject. So that's the one. That's the main verb. That's the one you're looking for. And it can have complements. Remember, complements are the things that the verb licenses. They can appear with certain verbs, but not others. Adjuncts can just appear with whatever they want, whenever they want. All right. So here are some examples. Here is an example of a complement that's licensed by the head of the clause, which is the verb. They read comic books. Comic books is licensed by read. Now what happens with a sentence like they read elephants? What can we say about that? We say it doesn't make sense, right? Is it ungrammatical? No. Remember that points like this are where you separate semantics from syntax. The fact that that sentence has a meaning problem doesn't have anything to do with whether it's grammatical or not. It's perfectly grammatical. We have a hard time figuring out what it means, but we don't say that there's a grammar mistake there. Because read is a verb that can license direct objects. And that's what it's doing. It doesn't really matter if the direct object is comic books or elephants or water or anything else. Now contrast that with a verb like relax. They relax is a good sentence, right? They relax comics book, comic books? No, ungrammatical. Relax doesn't license direct object complements. Sit doesn't license direct object complements. They sit comic books is ungrammatical. So remember, the principle of complements is that they have to be licensed by something. So they're grammatical when the licensing element is there, and they're ungrammatical when it's not. Now an adjunct in contrast isn't licensed. It can be put into a verb phrase regardless of what the head of the phrase is. So take the word fast. They read fast. 
they sit fast, they relax fast. All of those are grammatical. They relax fast has a semantic problem, right? If you said that, it would probably be a joke. But it doesn't have a grammatical problem because it doesn't matter where you want to put the adjunct fast. It doesn't need to be licensed. It's just an adjunct. Another example is they read under the bridge. They relax under the bridge. They pontificate under the bridge. Any verb makes that sentence grammatical because under the bridge is just an adjunct. Okay. Now, a special kind of compliment is a direct object. And there are some verbs that license the direct object and actually require the direct object. This clause is not grammatical unless they have the direct object. So take, they discussed under the bridge. Bad sentence, right? And they discussed quickly is also a bad sentence. Why are they bad? Is it because the adjunct isn't licensed under the bridge or quickly? isn't licensed by the verb? No, that's not the problem. Those are adjuncts and they don't need to be licensed. What's the problem here is that disgust is a verb that not only licenses a direct object, it requires it. So we call that kind of verb transitive and we call it the kind of verb that licenses a direct object we call transitive. When it requires a direct object, it's obligatorily transitive. There aren't really very many of those in English at all, but they in this case, you'll make a sentence ungrammatical, not by adding under the bridge, but by leaving out the direct object. All right, there are some things besides verbs that can license complements. We don't need to worry about those today, fortunately. We're going to talk about these five canonical clause structures, and all the complements that we're going to talk about are licensed by verbs. So take a, a phrase like, this is a noun phrase, not a clause, right? Because there's no verbs here. Their familiarity with the data is a good sentence. Their familiarity is a good noun phrase, excuse me. Their familiarity of the data, bad noun phrase. Their knowledge of the data would be okay. Their knowledge with the data is a bad noun phrase. So this is just to show you that a noun, in this case, can license a complement. And the complement may be, um, well, it may not be a noun phrase. It may be a noun phrase, or it may be something else. And in this case, it could be a prepositional phrase with a specific preposition. So verbs aren't the only things that license stuff, but they're the only things that license stuff that we're going to worry about today. All right, here are the five clause types. Once you've understood complements, you're going to be able to understand these five clause types. Now, they all have subjects because they're all canonical, right? So the difference between them is going to be what the verb is licensing in each one of them. You don't have to worry about analyzing the part of the sentence that's a subject. Just identify it and then disregard it. But do make sure that when you give your example sentences, you give ones that have subjects, all right? Because we want to deal with canonical clauses. So try not to use imperative sentences when you're demonstrating one of the clause structures. Look for one that has a subject and then a verb. Now to determine the clause type, look for the part that comes after the verb. And there are two dimensions to think about. One of them is the one we already talked about, transitivity, and we're going to talk about it more. Transitivity is, is there a direct object and is there an indirect object? So there are three possibilities, no object, one object, two objects. Those are the three possibilities of transitivity. The other aspect, the other dimension is complexity. That has to do not with objects, but with predicative complements. That one, there's only two possibilities. There's either one there or there's not. All right, let's take transitivity first. Let's look at the three possibilities. Here's the first one, a subject, and then inside the verb phrase, a verb and no object. So here's an example, Chloe and I, subject, ride, verb, 
in the back of a long black limousine. Object? No. Just, let's see. It could be a compliment. It could be an adjunct. We would have to analyze it to see. I'm thinking that it's a long adjunct. But even if it were a compliment, we wouldn't consider it an object. The clue right away is that it's not a noun phrase. It's a prepositional phrase. In is the head of it, right? In is a preposition. This is a prepositional phrase. Here's another one. These days, these days surfers, the surfers of these days, right? And that's the noun phrase. That's the subject. Ride, the verb, all over the waves, another prepositional phrase. The head of it is over, not an object. I ride, subject verb, from my home in Cherry Hills, downtown and back. Another prepositional phrase, not an object. So what we have here is the first possibility, a verb with no object. These are the intransitive clauses. You're going to see that these are the ordinary intransitive clauses. Okay, let's take these examples. You ride a sled down the 2,050-foot track to the banks of the Mississippi. What elements are you seeing there? You, subject, ride, verb, a sled, aha, a noun phrase. And then after that, there's a prepositional phrase, right? But that noun phrase right after the verb, that's a direct object. Take the second example. Residents who call themselves curiprense, subject, still ride, verb, horses, direct object. Usually the direct object answers a what or a who question, right? So we would say, what do they ride? They ride horses. It doesn't always, but that's one clue. If it does, you've almost always got a direct object. Here's another one. She rides the waves. The waves. What does she ride? She rides the waves. The direct object. All right, that noun phrase after the verb is usually a direct object. Now, it's not always. Here are a couple of cases where it's not. I ride 200 to 300 miles a week. Miles is the head of that phrase, right? And that's a noun. Home is also a noun. Are those the direct object? No. Those are one of the few cases where you would get a noun phrase directly after a verb that's not the direct object. But you can tell. What you can do is a test like this. Take the sentence where we did have a direct object. Residents who call themselves curiprense still ride horses. See if we can replace horses by a pronoun in the objective case. The objective ones are like him, them, us, me, and some of the ones you can't tell, right? Like her is, yeah, her is objective. It is one of the ones you can't tell because it is nominative and also objective. But if it goes there, that's also fine. All right, but in this case, we can replace horses because it's plural with them. Fits perfectly, right? This is a sign of a direct object. If you can replace that noun phrase with an objective pronoun and the clause still sounds good, then that's a sign of a direct object. It works for this one, too. You ride a sled. A sled is an indefinite noun phrase, so let's replace it with an indefinite pronoun, one. You ride one down the 2,050-foot track. No matter what, whether you like the meaning of that sentence or not, it's perfectly grammatical. Those are direct objects. Watch what happens with the sentences that we said didn't have direct objects. I ride 200 to 300 miles a week. I ride them a week. No, bad sentence. They ride home from Strawberry and Silence. They ride it from Strawberry and Silence. No, not unless it was coming from a completely different word, right? They ride the bicycle home. They ride the bicycle from strawberry would be okay. They ride it from strawberry. But you can't replace home there with it. So that's one way that you can tell that you don't have a direct object if you suspect that the noun phrase isn't one. Try that pronoun test and that will probably get you there. All right, so let's, let's um, sum up the, let's repeat the two structures that we've looked at so far. An intransitive clause has no direct object. Chloe and I ride in the back of a long black limousine. 
doesn't matter how much comes after the verb, it's not an object. Transitive, and your book is going to call this monotransitive, so let's get in that habit. Monotransitive verbs do have a direct object. You ride a sled, and then there can be other complements or adjuncts after that, but there is that direct object. The third possibility for transitivity is that there are two objects. We call these clauses ditransitive. Here's an example. This gives people, there's a noun phrase, a chance to get away from all that. There's another noun phrase. Two objects. The way he moved, subject, gave, verb, coop, a noun phrase. Some confidence that everything was okay, another noun phrase. My dad sends verb me, noun phrase. Fresh salmon and halibut, another noun phrase. The clauses where there are two noun phrases after the verb are likely to be ditransitive. These two noun phrases are not interchangeable. They don't act the same. But one thing we can see is that they are complements. We can see that because if we put a different verb in, the sentence becomes ungrammatical. This gives people a chance to get away from all that is good, right? Suppose we change that verb to one that means almost the same thing. This imparts people a chance to get away from all that. Whoa, bag clause. Similarly, if we say my dad sends me fresh salmon and halibut, that's good. But if we say the mail service transports me fresh salmon and halibut, that's bad. What does this indicate? Some verbs can license those two noun phrases, but not most verbs. There are only a few verbs that create the ditransitive structure, that can create the ditransitive structure. And the two noun phrases following the verb are not just both direct objects. They act a little bit differently, so we want to call them something different. Let's look at some of their properties. One thing is that you can't switch their order. So gives people a chance, blah, 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 is OK. But suppose we wanted to put that noun phrase that's last first. This gives a chance to get away from all that. People? No. Bad sentence. The way he moved, gave, coop. One noun phrase has to come first. Let's suppose we try to put the other one first and put that one last. The way he moved gave some confidence that everything was okay, coop. No, they have to be in a specific order. Another difference between them is that there are certain syntactic operations you can do with the ones that are occurring in that second place that you can't do with the ones that are occurring right after the verb. So take the way he moved gave coop some confidence that everything was okay. Suppose we want to ask a question about the second verb, noun phrase, some confidence that everything was OK. Let's replace it with a question word. It's a noun phrase, so let's say what. What did the way he moved give Coop? It's not stylistically very good, right? But it's grammatical. There's nothing wrong with the grammar there. Now let's try the other thing. Let's try replacing Coop with a question word. Who did? The way he moved gives some confidence that it was OK. <laughs> no, bad sentence. And if you're thinking that it's only bad because the, the noun phrase is too long, take off the part that says that it was OK. Who did the way he moved give some confidence? No, it just doesn't sound right, right? We, will, we keep wanting to add to, right? To whom did the way he moved give some confidence? Or who did the way he moved give some confidence to? And that's a different structure. Then you're dealing with a prepositional phrase. So the ones, the noun phrases that are coming second all the time also can't be moved to the front in the interrogative clauses. Your book shows you a few other syntactic operations that you can't do with, these, with the, the indirect objects. The ones that come right after the verb, we're going to end up calling the indirect object. And the ones that come second that you can do more syntactic operations with, we're going to call the direct object. Now, here's another kind of difference between them, and that is that some verbs allow a direct object by itself. You already saw a ride, right? In fact, a lot of verbs allow a direct object by itself. 
And there are also some verbs that require both the indirect object and the direct object, usually except for some idioms, okay, like the verb give. You have to give somebody something. If you just give something, then you're talking about a pretty restricted register, like maybe you're talking about um, um, like how much did you give last year? You would be talking about philanthropical contributions or um, you would be talking about blood donations. We've accepted that, like I gave at the office, right? We've accepted the idiom. Actually, we've accepted the idiom with no objects at all in the context of donating blood. But normally give requires both objects. You have to give somebody something. All right, so you have some verbs that require both an indirect object and a direct object, and you have some that allow a direct object by itself. You don't have any that license just an indirect object by itself. So indirect objects are different from direct objects in a special way. They do not occur without the direct object also being there. So you could take the sentence, my dad sends me fresh salmon and halibut from Alaska. If you take out me, my dad sends fresh salmon and halibut from Alaska. That's still a pretty good sentence. It's still grammatical. But if you just say, my dad sends me, it's no longer grammatical unless, you have, unless you're working with a different sentence, a sentence where your dad is sending you to somewhere, right? It doesn't work as an indirect object. After school, Charlotte offers will, that's the indirect object, a ride home, that's a direct object. After school, Charlotte offers a ride home. You'll see that kind of, if that one looks weird to you, um, it's because I've taken it out of context. If you look in the corpus, you'll see offer used with just a direct object all the time. There's a lot of examples. Go ahead and look at some of them. They're pretty interesting. It happens in literature more than in normal speech, I think, in casual speech. Okay, but the point is here, you can't say, after school, Charlotte offers Will. No, you have to know what she's offering him, right? The offer is going to require a direct object. You have to offer something. Okay, so when a noun phrase to sum up has two objects, they're not the same thing. They act differently in the language, and we distinguish them by calling them indirect object and direct object. Now we can see the three categories of transitivity. Intransitive clauses are ones where there's no direct object. Monotransitive ones are ones where there is a direct object only. Ditransitive ones are ones where there is both a direct object and an indirect object. So far, so good. The next dimension after transitivity, we have complexity. The only other one for these clauses. Remember, for complexity, there are only two choices. It's complex or not. And you only have those choices with the intransitive and the monotransitive clauses. Ditransitive ones, you don't have to worry about. They can't be complex. Intransitive ones can be ordinary intransitive or complex intransitive. Monotransitive ones can be monotransitive or complex transitive. All right. We call them complex if they have a predicate complement. We're going to see what those are, and we're going to see that there are two kinds. There's a subject compl subjective complements, is what your book calls them, and objective complements. If you Google object complement, you're going to find much information that implies a different, that relies on a different concept of that phrase than your book does. So I recommend that you not do that until the book's concept is pretty well embedded in your head. It's better to understand them right now both as predicative complements than to call them subject complements and object complements, unless that helps you. All right. And Intransitive clause can have a subject complement. So here are some examples. Her classmates, that's a subject. Were is the verb. Children of Hollywood stars is not an object. It is a noun phrase, right? It's not a direct object. I'm going to show you why in a minute. It's a predicative complement, and it's a subjective one if that helps you. All right. Doctors become experts in a particular area. That is a predicative complement. Adequate and safe water is important for human health and well-being, predicative complement. 
Now see if you can find it in the last sentence. You find the verb. It comes after that. Using photographs seemed natural to me. Predicative complement. There's another clause there. In the other clause, actually the other clause has one too, okay? My parents, subject, um, verb, were, and professional photographers, also a predicative complement. So you have five complex intransitives there. All right, here are the complements in green. In the last sentence, you might be thinking that to me is also a complement, but don't worry about that one right now. It's not a predicative complement. The ones in green are all subjective predicative complements. They're in the same place that a direct object would be, but we don't call them direct objects, and here's where we should see why. The thing is they don't function the same way. One big difference is that direct objects can normally become the subject of a passive clause if you change the clause to passive. Direct objects, right? She rides the waves. Remember the waves, right? Was a direct object. Now if we want to make this clause passive, the waves becomes a subject are ridden like moguls and you can say by her or you can leave that part off. Stylistically, it's bad. I know what you're thinking, but grammatically, it's okay. The direct object becomes a subject, and the waves are ridden is grammatical. The waves are ridden like moguls is also grammatical. The waves are ridden like moguls by her is stylistically a disaster, but it's still grammatical. Now, let's try it with the predicative complement. Her classmates were children of Hollywood stars. Let's take the PC, children of Hollywood stars, now, here we're going to have to try to make the be verb into passive. And so we get were been, right, where the lexical verb is the past participle, and the other one shows the tense, the auxiliary verb shows the tense, and then by her classmates. Completely uninterpretable, right? The same thing with doctors become experts in a particular area. Experts in a particular area are become by doctors. No, this just doesn't work. The predicative complements are not becoming subjects of a passive clause. And it may look to you like the whole problem there is with the verbs, that the verbs don't want to become, don't want to take the passive structure. But we can actually see that even if the verb will do that okay, there's a problem with a predicate to complement doing it. We can take that if we look at one of the very few verbs that license either a predicate to complement or a direct object. One of the very few that do that is prove. So let's take the sentence where cabbage mozzarella soup proves the point. Is the point a direct object or is it a predicate to complement? Let's make the passive. The point is proven or proved if you like that past participle better. I'm a little old fashioned about that one. The point is proven. And then you can say buy her cabbage mozzarella soup if you, if you want. Perfectly grammatical. That's a direct object. But check this one out. Often just reaching the beach proved a problem. Often a problem was proven by just reaching the beach. No, this one doesn't work, right? Proved in this case is the other meaning of proved, which is turned out to be, right? Just reaching the beach turned out to be a problem. When it has that meaning, it assigns predicative complements, and when there are predicative complements, the passive doesn't work, even though the verb doesn't have any objection to going into passive construction. All right, that's a difference between predicative complements and direct objects. Another difference between them is that the direct objects are almost always noun phrases. There are so few exceptions that we're not going to worry about them in this class unless they happen to come up, and then we will. But the predicative complements are very often noun phrases and also very often adjective phrases. There's no problem at all with a predicative complement being an adjective phrase. 
So if we go back to the examples that we have, you see noun phrase complements in three of these clauses, right? Pick them out. And in the other two, you see adjective phrase complements. See it? Important is an adjective, and that's the head of the adjective phrase. Natural is an adjective, and that's the head of the adjective phrase. Those are predicative complements, just like children of Hollywood stars. It's okay if they're nouns. It's okay if they're adjectives. The direct objects aren't going to be adjectives. You're not going to see that. All right, now let's come back to our classification for a minute. This is the point to remember. An intransitive sentence is ordinary intransitive if it doesn't have a subject complement, and it's complex intransitive if it does. These clauses are all intransitive. You can't find any direct objects in any of them, right? But in the second two, or sorry, in the third and the fourth, you do see subject complements, predicative complements. In the first one, you see the noun phrase, a canny businessman. And in the last one, you see the adjective phrase, suspicious. That's the complement of looks, right? Now you know how to identify ordinary intransitive sentences and complex intransitive sentences, clauses rather. You also know how to identify the ditransitive clauses, remember that, and they're never complex. If they have a direct and an indirect object, they're ditransitive and that's that. All right, those are three kinds. Now the last two kinds to think about are the monotransitives. Well, we'll call one the monotransitive and we'll call the other one the complex transitive. And you've seen the monotransitives. So here are some examples of the complex transitive. I find the long, that's a verb, right? Find. The long habit of living, noun phrase, hard to break, adjective phrase. The media promptly crowned, verb, him, noun phrase. America's first space traveler, noun phrase. The smoke made matters, noun phrase, worse, adjective phrase. Right? These are transitive, meaning there's a direct object. Can you see it? All right, here are the direct objects in blue. Now, what makes these sentences complex transitive is the predicate complement. Okay, but the transitive ones don't have a predicate complement that relates to the subject. They have a predicate complement that relates to the object. And because they're predicative complements, they can either be noun phrases or adjective phrases. That part's all the same. The only part is really what noun phrase they're related to. All right. They're going to appear right after the direct object, so try to find the ones here, right after the direct object. In the first two sentences, the predicate complement is a noun phrase. In the last three, it's an adjective phrase. Semantically, you can notice that they relate to the object, not the subject. So for example, in the second sentence, America's purported first space traveler is him, right? It's the same person as him. It's not the media. The media is the subject. America's first space traveler isn't related to that. It's related to the him that is the object. Okay, here's a recap of all of the phrases, of all of the clause structures. The trains run on time. That's just an adjunct, no direct object here, ordinary and transitive. Longfellow was a canny businessman. Is that a direct object? No way. The be verb never assigns direct objects. The be verb assigns predicative complements. So that's complex and transitive. She rides the waves like moguls. Monotransitive, one direct object. The smoke made matters worse. Complex transitive, direct object, predicative complement. This gives people a chance to get away from all that 
indirect object, direct object, ditransitive. Okay, when you do the analysis, just don't get tripped up by these two things, right? First of all, don't let something look like, don't let something make you think that it's an object or a predicative complement when it's not really. Don't look at any adverbs or prepositional phrases. There are rare circumstances where prepositional phrases can be objects, but you're not going to see any of them in these cases. We're not going to go for those marginal kinds of sentences. Look at this sentence. They ran fast in the other direction. Could you use this clause to prove that run is a transitive verb? Could you use this clause to prove that run can make a complex intransitive clause? No, neither, right? Fast is just an adverb. In the other direction is just a prepositional phrase. It turns out that they're both adjuncts, but even if they were complements, they would not be the kind of complement they were interested in. They wouldn't be predicative complements or direct objects. Okay, also don't get tripped up by this. Don't get tripped up by thinking that some a clause that means the same as another has the same structure. You have to be able to distinguish that. I know I keep saying that again and again, but um, it's a little bit tricky with this exercise because there can be a very small change that changes the structure completely. Okay, let's look at some of these examples. One of the volunteers made me indirect object, some oatmeal direct object. What kind? Ditransitive. What if I asked you to show that make licenses ditransitive, licenses direct objects and indirect objects, so it allows ditransitive clauses, and you gave me this sentence. One of the volunteers made some oatmeal for me, and you said, well, me is the indirect object. No. It means exactly the same thing as the first one, yeah. Well, there might be some small technical difference. To me, it means the same thing. But the structure is not the same. For me is a prepositional phrase. And I think it's a complement here of the verb make, but it doesn't matter. It's not an indirect object. The indirect object is a noun phrase, not a prepositional phrase. And it comes right after the verb. It comes between the verb and the direct object. It goes subject, verb, indirect object, direct object. For me is a prepositional phrase and it's in the wrong place. So that doesn't indicate that make allows ditransitive clauses. And sometimes that can actually give you the wrong answer. So take the word teach. You can get a sentence like Master Lo Fung taught us the five styles. And now if my question to you were, does teach allow ditransitive clauses? And you said, yes, it does, and you gave me this sentence, then I would accept that. Then you would, that would be a successful argument. And then I, if I ask you, well, does t explain allow ditransitive clauses? You say, yes, and you give me this. Master Lo Fung explained to us the five styles. <laughs> no. Do you see the difference? It's really small and it's not even stressed when you say it, so this can be hard to catch. Don't let this trip you up. To us is not us. To us is a prepositional phrase and it's a complement, but it's not an indirect object. An indirect object is a noun phrase. If you went, Master Lo Fung explained us the five styles, you'd get an ungrammatical clause. So your answer to me would be, no, explain does not allow ditransitive clauses, and here is my evidence. The master explained us the five styles is an ungrammatical clause. That would be a good argument.